Okay, welcome to the podcast. Today we have as our special guest, the Athletics Director of the University of Georgia, Josh Brooks. And Josh, what a year the dogs have had. Uh, I'm not real good on this Learfield Cup, but top 10, you got to be maybe even top seven or eight. You got to be fired up about it, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, obviously uh, through our conversations, you know, I track it pretty closely. Um, people even make fun of me how precise I track it with spreadsheets and and constantly updating it. But we're going to finish eighth uh, by my projections this year. Uh, you know, we were close to finishing sixth or seventh, you know, uh, uh, a sport here, a race there, a couple points. But I'm sure other schools could make the same argument. But, um, but you know, ultimately the, the ultimate goal, and it's going to take time, is to win the whole thing. You know, obviously uh, when you talk about Learfield, for those that don't know, um, you're allowed to count 19 sports. Um, so if you have more than that, you can drop your lower score. So schools that have 25 or 30 sports have more bites at the apple. Um, we have 20 NCAA sports. We don't get any points for equestrian. It's not a uh, sponsored NCAA sports. We have 20 out of 19. Um, so we don't have the same advantage that some schools like Stanford, Michigan, or Ohio State may have. But no excuses. The ultimate goal is to win the whole thing. And um, I'm a firm believer in kind of putting that mindset out there and, and visualizing that and, and and that's the uh, ultimate goal. Yeah, I like the way you uh, are around all the sports and uh, I see at all the events. That's really good to see uh, that kind of support. And you kind of live and die with the dogs just like the fans do. But as you know, this is more of a football-related uh, podcast, but we're going to get into some other sports facility-wise and all. But uh, I got to be excited about you being able to lend some info about the stadium itself and uh, where we stand this year and going forward as far as what you're uh, what you've got planned for the uh, Stanford stadium, Josh. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a two year, uh, two phase approach. So we we've got, you know, what less than 80 days for the first game. So phase one is wrapping up right now. Uh, the, the, the primary focus of phase one is centered around the South 100 improvement. So we, I'm sure, a lot of our fans that, you know, most of our loyal longtime season ticket holders sit in that South 100 area. So that concourse, as many know, has been a point of congestion for a long time. It was literally 10 feet in width. Expanding it by blowing out the restrooms, concessions along that pathway to now 23 feet in width and building new restrooms and concessions near Gate 9 and Gate 6. And with that, um, one of those concession stands will be a grab-and-go style built um, like the Augusta National Model, and the restrooms will have more, um, you know, more, more stalls, more points of, of use. So increasing capacity, uh, increasing ingre- ingress and egress, also building the foundation right now for what will be the new press box in phase two, which we'll build next offseason. The other key piece of this construction is a connection point from the bridge. You'll be able to enter the stadium from the bridge, um, basically almost like a new gate nine, um, in that Southwest corner. Now, the other thing that's important to understand is we're encapsulating the bridge as part of the stadium now. So that's going to cause um, some minor issues for those that like to travel the bridge pregame, but the benefits far outweigh it by bringing that in and encapsulating that as part of the game and part of the stadium on game day. Now we have more room to do points of sale, more room for flow. So it's really going to, the net positive is, is such, is so big that we felt that it was worth, losing it pregame and people will just have to adjust their pathways if they're coming from north to south or south to north um, passing through the bookstore or through the tate center area um, to get you know past the stadium on the west side yeah and and for the fans that aren't up on it uh, the 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 movement of the press box is going to be which way and then you're going to add some more premier seating there too right so we're taking the existing press box And we're going to build a new press box in the southwest corner, roughly on the 10, 15 yard line. Um, And we're also going to put some suites with that as well. And then take the pre the the former press box and turn it, turn it into a new premium space, which will be the the, the best premium space in the stadium. And we've had um, such great response from our donors the last few years, um, you know, donating to allow us to build the West end zone, to build the indoor, to build the Buttsmere expansion. We needed more premium space to accommodate all the phenomenal donors that have stepped up. So this is going to give those donors a chance for a new premium opportunity. 
And it's also going to create a trickle up effect of seat availability. So as people move into the new premium area in the former press box, there will be more spots come open in the champions club, the sky club, other club areas. So it's going to give a lot of people opportunities to improve their seating situation. So I'm excited about that trickle up effect. Especially with the way teams winning and everything, and you can't have too many good uh, places like that for them to sit. So, uh, one of the things that really is, uh, you know, a big point of emphasis for everybody here is the Georgia Florida game, and and nobody better to talk about than you. I don't want you to give away any trade secrets, but what's the situation now? I know you signed a new contract for two years, but go into that and then what's going on with this uh, expansion of their stadium and how that might affect us. Yeah. So we've, um, we've enacted the extension for seasons 24 and 25 for Jacksonville. Um, right now there's a projection that there'll be construction in 26 and 27, which will force us in Florida to move the site of the game. So this is an opportunity for us to, you know, work with Florida and look at all options, right? So there'll be an option of, looking at a home and home there'll be an option of looking at uh, different neutral sites so really we're gonna we have time we're gonna take our time and evaluate all our options and um, you know obviously we're gonna fight for what's best for the University of Georgia um, but we also work uh, in great relationship with with the University of Florida I know that's hard for some people to hear but um, we've worked very well with them throughout the years and um, you know there's a lot of opinions about and, and beliefs and and about the game and its future. But at the end of the day, we've got to do what's best for the University of Georgia, and that's going to be our focus. Yeah, I'm sure you'll do that. You always have. But one of the questions I had that maybe you can answer, is why would they wait two years to start? Do they have to get some funding on that or more tax dollars? Or how? what's the situation? If they, if they know they're going to increase the stadium or redo it, why, do they, why is it going to be two years? You know, I would say um, – I don't know that the particulars of that exactly, but I can tell you from my experience with construction, a lot of times you come up with a rendering and you're going to need another 12 to 18 months to take that from a concept design to construction documents before you can actually break ground. Right. So they can, you can, anybody can come up with a rendering in a month or two of what you want to do, but really developing with architects, the, the construction docs takes longer than just the rendering of what they'll show you. So that could be part of it. The other part of it, could possibly be that they've got to work through some scheduling logistics of they may need time to figure out what they're going to do and where they're going to, where the Jaguars are going to play for those two years. Um, that could factor into as well, but, but it works out good for us. So we can, it gives us time to look at all our options and, and, uh, and, and give us, gives us time to, to make the best decision for us. That's why you're the man. You answer these questions and all our fans are glad to hear that. Um, SEC scheduling tonight, it's going to come out for the 24 season, but just a little bit, uh, catbird seat, you were right there at SEC meetings last week, uh, back and forth about eight, nine games, uh, two new teams coming in the league. Uh, there's, there's nothing I want you to say specific, but eventually do you see that the scheduling model will go to nine or is it just going to be a, a year to year thing till we get it situated? You know, the, the good news is the way we have it situated for, for eight for right now, if we had to go eight another year, it could be a, it, it would be easy transition. Or we could, if we went to nine, we could transition to that as well. They've set it up well to where we have flexibility in 25 to pivot as needed. But I think the biggest thing throughout all of this, and we've heard it from the fans, is uh, the greater schedule veritability, bringing Texas, bringing Oklahoma into the mix. It's going to give us, and, and now having one division instead of two, it's going to give us greater variability where you're not seeing the same Eastern teams year in and year out. And like we said before, being able to say that you're going to go to every venue once in four years and every team is going to come to Sanford once every four years is really special. Now, there could be years where it feels, you know, as you always know, right, what, what looks like it could be an easy schedule, could be a hard schedule or vice versa. So there could be years where you say, wow, that that schedule looks tough. But, you, you know, it's going to be tougher because, um, you know, bringing in teams like Texas and Oklahoma, there's going to be, you know, new opponents that you haven't seen in the past as part of the conference schedule. So um, but I'm excited. I think that in combination with the 12 team playoff is going to uh, make for an exciting regular season. 
Yeah, there's no question about that. I'm fired up about it. But I'm going to ask you one other thing. What if – now, we're going to get that scheduled tonight, and if, if all of a sudden – we don't have a, a nine-game schedule in 25. Would we automatically just play the other eight teams the next in 25 that we're not that we're playing in 24? Yeah, I think that's the the initial thought is that if we didn't, um, if we stuck to that, that it would be a flop flop situation where the teams were the way go home or, and, and vice versa. So um, that's that's one of the concepts out there. But we still, you know, we still have to get back at the, uh, you know working on the plan for beyond 24 because hey, that, that's good. So my man Dane here wants to ask you about a couple other sports here, and then I'm going to come back here and uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, all our fans certainly enjoy these uh, issues because you can't imagine how many of them have an opinion on it. I and mean, maybe they re- listen to the man helps them out a little bit. So <laughs> I don't know. If I'm the man, but you know, we appreciate Look, I understand one thing is AD. I've got to understand that everyone, and I talk to our people, Everyone's very opinionated, but I appreciate that because that shows passion and that shows support. So I, I can never expect all of our fans to agree on any one topic or how something should be. So, but the the main thing is I appreciate everybody's passion because that's what makes this place so special. Josh, it's harder to find two bigger tennis fans than me and Coach Donnan. So we try to inject some tennis talk into all we do on this channel. I want to know where we stand with the uh, construction happening with tennis yeah. and then specifically what opportunities does that create for Georgia to uh, really bolster the tennis legacy that it's created with such great uh, relationships, great coaches, and uh, events with the NCAA? Yeah, so right now um, it, it's an exciting phase for the tennis project. The steel is going up, so you can see the the physical building taking shape, which is is great because so so much construction early on is just digging and digging footings, and it's like all right, when is this going to happen? So seeing the 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 frame go up, giving you the shape of the building is very exciting. That's going up now, and when you think about this indoor facility, what I personally feel adding that indoor to what we already have gives us the best tennis complex in all the country, right? So we've already been able to recruit to that facility. So when you can point to that indoor, that grandstand, our facilities, our history, um, it's an easy sales pitch when you throw in the university in Athens and everything else. Um, And I think it's already led to the success we've had in recruiting when you think about the young men and women we've already signed. And then on top of that, knowing that we're going to be hosting national soon and hopefully competing to host more national events here as well, um, and then having that true six court indoor that the young men and women can train in year round um, and the teams can split it evenly three court to the women, three court to the men, and they can train at the same time. I think that shows a commitment to a recruit. So, um, and as y'all know, and coach knows, I'm, I'm a pretty passionate uh, fan of our tennis program. So when a recruit comes in here and sits down with me and I can talk about our commitment to the program, whether it be through facilities or whatever, and then I can also speak, about my passion about the sport and how much I support it, I, I think it goes a long way and it shows that we're committed to being successful in tennis and I think it's helped us in recruiting. Well, the commitment to one of the sports came up yesterday. You had the delightful problem of having to schedule an introductory news conference for a baseball coach who had to find time to come to Athens before getting to Omaha. Uh, Wes Johnson was talking just about uh, the commitment that's being made with the facilities at baseball. What can Georgia baseball fans expect from Foley in the coming years? Yeah, so very excited about this right now. So when we took on this project, the primary focus was improving – the student athlete experience and the areas in which they spend their time and train. That, that, that was the thing that we felt was lacking first and foremost. We look, we we know there are bigger stadiums, but we think we've got a venue and that's kind of the Wrigley field, one of the best settings, beautiful venues in all of college baseball. But uh, we know we have to improve the player amenities, whether that's hitting cage, whether that's a the state of the art pitching lab, lounge, renovated locker room, team meeting room, coaches' offices, weight room, things of that nature. So we're going to have all of those things in this building, first and foremost. Now, with every project, and I'm giving a little uh, insider secret away here, anytime we do a project, we always have a contingency built in. I know this from my days working in facilities. So you always want to have a safety net of a contingency built in. And and with the current state of inflation, we've had to you know protect ourselves for when you go to buy out materials and buy things out to, to – be able to cover that. Hopefully we've done a good enough job 
that through this project, we'll do some more things on the back end. I've got some ideas, but some of the other things that are already included in this project are going to be new LED lights like the Braves have, where you can do, or like we have at Sanford, um, we're going to extend the canopy of the grandstand to give shade um, for the entire grandstand. We're adding seats on the third base side. We're adding a new entry uh, off Rutherford on the third base side with a new um, standing room only plaza area, like a congregation area with new restrooms, a new point of sale. But beyond that, like I was saying, if we've got some funds left over to end the project or it could be a phase two, I really want to think about the future of right field and left field. Um, and that's going to be some conversation I'm going to have with coach about his thoughts and his vision, because I think if, if, if we have the opportunity, I'd love to move that scoreboard over a little bit more toward the center and give us more area in right field that we can keep developing that area. We came up with a new concept in right area in right field this, this, this season where it was, we, we sold the area. We did general seating with some high boys and, and, and uh, high chair backs. And that was really popular. So we think we can keep expanding that concept and uh, really growing that right field area. And then I've got some ideas for left field as well, but you know, with everything else, it's, it's never, nothing's ever done or finished or complete. It's always, you want to keep improving. So I'm excited of where we're immediately headed for Foley. And I'm excited for what the possibilities are beyond that. Well, say just a few things about, I know yesterday you talked about him all day, but just for the fans that missed out on the, the personnel hiring of uh, coach, uh, coach West coming in here, uh, you know, it, it seems to me like this guy's got the kind of resume and his knowledge of the state and being a pitching coach like he is really brings a lot to the table. Yeah. So, um, first of all, anytime you, you're you doing a coach that search, there's certain metrics you want to look for of qualifications that kind of narrow your pull down and say, okay, th these are the types of people or these are the candidates that fit the criteria I'm looking for. And then beyond that, you start, for me, the next step is getting into the character of a person. And he was one that stood out really early on as you talk to other ADs, as you talk to other coaches, as you talk to uh, uh, men that, that played for him, the, the positive feedback was overwhelming. Um, so that really got me excited just about his character. And then when I was able to interview him and talk to him and meet with him face to face, it just blew me away. And um, it's just such a great combination of someone who's got a little old school in him, new school in him. I think he's on the forefront of how he uses analytics, how he uses technology to, to get the most out of his players. He, he knows how to push his players, but he knows how to love them too. Um, so I think he just checked every box and then some. And, um, you know, I think when you get for me, when you get to that point, it's, it's, it's kind of going with your gut and your, and your gut feeling. And, uh, and I, I, I just, I've just been blown away with him so far and I'm so excited for him to get going. Um, this may be the only time in 20 plus years that I've rooted for an LSU team. <laughs> it's a weird feeling. Well, back in the old days, you used to root for him when you yeah, were. Yeah, I washed all that away a long time ago, but I have been rooting for him and I'm excited for him and, and I want to see him do well, uh, finish out here, especially since LSU can't jump us in the Learfield cup. Right. Um, right. It's not gonna bother me. Yeah. So, uh, Talking about a couple other issues here, and then I want to just get into the uh, transfer portal and NIL from the athletic director's uh, uh, situation here. But give us an update on uh, Stegman and uh, what all you've had to do and what, what the projections are. I know you told me about maybe moving the scoreboard, some of your vision yeah. there. Uh, maybe maybe that's something you don't want to talk about. No, that no. Yeah. So, so let's start with what we're doing right now this summer. Um so we're doing the remediation to, to, to repair the ceiling, which is actually a much simpler fix, but it's going to provide a safe atmosphere. And, and at the same time, we're going to go ahead and paint the ceiling black, which I think will give the, the whole venue a more modern look. I've always I've stared at that ceiling for years and thought if we could paint it black, it would really, really modernize the feel. Um, so we've already started that process. And, and by the looks of what's been done so far, I'm really excited. That alone is going to make um, give Stegman an even more modern look. Now, moving down the road, and, and this is not final. These are just concepts we're working through. My vision is on the the non-horseshoe end, the, the end where that small video board is now, is to basically build a massive video board on that wall and almost remove the, remove the center hung, create one of the largest video boards in the country on that wall, um, 
redo the sound, redo the lighting, um, and really make it impactful uh, for the fan experience and really clean up the venue and clean up the look and akin keep modernizing Stegman because I think we really do have good bones. And I think when we, um, when we, when we get to that point, people are going to be blown away what it's going to look like. And then there's even thoughts beyond that of what we can do with um, we're going to start digging in and looking into what we can do and adding premium spaces. I think we have some opportunities on the horseshoe end um, to, to really reimagine that as well. So um, I'm excited about the immediate future of Stegman and I'm excited about the long-term um vision for Stegman. And then look, the first thing that we have coming up is the reseeding and we're removing the students closer. And I think that's going to be a tremendous impact to get those students down on the, on the near court side to really impact the game and, and make it more of an impactful and loud atmosphere for visiting teams. Yeah. There's no question about uh, the, the addition of Mike White as our basketball coach. And you go to the games this year, we didn't finish quite as strong as we, we could have. We had some injuries there, but, I just thought uh, watching the way these kids played, work together, uh, he's got a good vision. And uh, I think moving those uh, students in there is going to be good. I mean, the home court advantage is going to be outstanding. Uh, another issue that has come up at your recent uh, meeting of the uh, at, down at Reynolds Plantation is the announcement that you're uh, eventually going to move the track uh, to another site and uh, add another baseball, I mean, another football field. I, I didn't tell, tell Kirby I said baseball. <laughs> practice field there. So explain that and uh, what's going on. And, and also, just a word about our track coach, who really is uh, phenomenal, what she's done in the past and the way she's uh, she's had uh, to turn a few things around. But I, I'm excited about her, too. Yeah, so we, we finished second and fifth indoors, seventh and tenth. Outdoors, so four top ten finishes, indoor and outdoors. And she's growing that program. I can tell you the future is extremely bright on both sides. We're going to be a uh, – we were young on the women's side this year. We're probably going to be a little younger on the men's side next year. But we are really stacking up talent, and I'm telling you the future is going to be bright. So, Coach, you know I'm a big track guy as well. Um, I've obviously got kids that are pretty big in the sport. And I can tell you to, to run a proper track meet, we need more space. We just don't have – the space needed. We're so landlocked here that by moving the track facility down South Millage where we have land, we can build it right. And that's going to help us in a number of ways, right? It starts with just our own team having, you know, once we build an outdoor and eventually build an indoor facility, having a space they can call their own that they can train 365 in first and foremost. Number two, having a big enough facility that we can host proper meets, whether that's SEC championships or bigger NCAA meets, that's the next step for our program. Beyond that, the other step that's good for our program, our university, and our city is hosting youth meets, okay? I've driven all over the state and been all over this country for youth meets, whether it's AAU or USATF with my kids. I can tell you that if we can build the right facility that can host USATF meets or AAU meets, that is so good for us. First of all, you think about young young boys and girls that step foot on your campus. And we all know that some of the best athletes are track athletes. So that this could impact multiple sports. Getting those kids on the campus of Georgia is going to be great indirect return long term down the road. Just getting them on our campus. Right. Then think about the impact it has for the town and gown as you know, you host an event for a week that would bring a thousand kids to town. That's a lot of hotels, restaurants. That's a great impact on the city of Athens during the middle of summer, which would be normally maybe more of a, a dead period of time. So that could be a financial impact to the town. So I think from a tax revenue standpoint, it'd be big. But again, not just student athletes, but students. I always believe if you can get kids on your campus, um, the return on that investment is big time. And then now thinking about once that track is gone, we take the, these, those, that space and open up a couple more practice fields and potentially some parking for our student athletes, which we so desperately need. It could be a game changer for our football program. You know, right now we have the two uh, grass fields that aren't even full hundred. Uh, one of them's not a full hundred yard field um, that run vertically. One of those fields has the indoor and the Buttsmere casting a large shadow on it. If we had two fields here that would get full sun all day, now having four fields, um, we would be able to rotate and it would actually save us money long-term and not having to resaw the field so much. And then number two, like coach smart has said, 
having practice field side to side uh, really improves the efficiency of practice. And if, if you know, you know this coach, if we know one thing about Coach Smart, efficiency is always going to be extremely important to him. So if we can improve the efficiency in the way we practice, especially when you're going, you know, ones and threes on one field, twos and fours on another, and you're trying to swap back and forth, it'll really uh, improve that as well, not to mention um, allowing us to save grass and rotate and not kill the same grass over and over. Yeah, I can just say firsthand, uh, you mentioned that about the athletes coming on campus, regardless of what, how old they are. Just to see the uh, numerous amount of kids that just were here for the youth camp for football or the seven on seven, uh, there, there comes a point where that's the first time seeing a campus or they, they fall in love with. This is the state university. We need to have some track events here. I know we have some swimming things that, that bring kids in. So in our last couple minutes here, we're going to talk about just the, the national issue here as far as where do you see the uh, legislation going? with your uh, your other fellow ADs and all. Uh, how do y'all feel about the national legislation on NIL? Yeah, so I think the key thing, Coach, I think we're focused on right now is getting uh, federal intervention. I think we, we, you know, we went to D.C. last week and, and met with several members of Congress and explained the need of why federal legislation is important. Um, and I think the key thing is when you look at the patchwork of state laws that we're dealing with right now, where there's imbalances between state to state, having federal legislation, it would be key um, for us uh, legislation that would um, preempt state laws that we were all playing, playing on, on the same rules. You know, the thing that people have got to understand is if we, especially with some of the things that are going on across the country, if we're not careful, we're going to get to a point where the funding is going to get distributed to maybe one or two sports and it could do damage to our other 19 or 18 sports. So we do believe in broad based programming. We want to be able to support 21 teams. And I think with some of the things that are being proposed, it, it, it could cause, uh, you know, serious threats to the future of all 21 sports. So, um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is we want transparency. You know, the worst thing of NIL is the rumors. Um, and we're trying to keep it. We're trying to keep it from being an inducement, where people are trying to induce or tamper with someone to get, try to get them to come to their school. Um, th those are the key things for me. And good luck on that one thing that Tubbleville's thing said he had. They had to be in school for one semester before they got nil. I mean, maybe that's uh, wishful thinking, but I, I mean that seems kind of out there. But uh, I never thought I'd see Tommy Tuttleville as a senator, but uh, and and to see him and Nick Saban at the same table, that was pretty. And he was calling him his good friend. But uh, we need to get you running for Congress soon, Coach. I mean, I think. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you that. Uh, I, hey, what I would do is whatever you can do for Kirby Smart, Mike White, and Josh Brooks. That's what we're going to vote for. But I can't tell you how much we appreciate you being with us here today, Josh. Uh, you know our fans are all Georgia. Boosters here to listen to this. Uh, we've had some really good guests, you know, like man, outside of our football people, but uh, you know, Manny and all, and uh, Jeff Wallace. And real quick, just a, a quick little blurb on uh, Drake Bernstein, your new tennis coach, and then we'll finish with that. Yeah, Drake is an absolute rock star. Um, you know, we're blessed to have a lot of alums coaching at the University of Georgia. Whether you're talking about Courtney Capetz, Drake Bernstein, Neil, and Steph. Coach Smart, Coach Abe, who played here, um, uh, Coach Diaz, on and on. That, that, that's special to me when you start with that. And someone who truly loves Georgia. Drake's a, Drake's a guy who had opportunities. He, you know, the last couple of years as assistant, people don't know this, I had a lot of ADs reaching out to me about Drake to be their head coach at other SEC programs. And I, and I had to fight him off uh, as best I could. And I was so glad to be able to, to reward him with that opportunity and, and reward his patience. But he's someone who has shown a lot to me already um, as Jeff let him grow these last two years and the work he's done in developing his student athletes and the work he's done in recruiting. Um, he's already hit the ground running and he did a phenomenal job in, in, uh, in his staff that he's already added to. And I know without a doubt, the future is extremely bright and he's going to continue to build on the success uh, that Coach Wallace started and uh, and has done so much for winning, you know, winning, winning, winning us uh, women's tennis coach of all time. And I know Drake will continue on his legacy.
is that young lady from Germany going to be eligible next year? She will be, yeah. I'll hey, see. Man, I tell you what, that's going to fire me up there. I mean, if we go with our, our team. And then, of course, our men's team has the number one recruiting class in the country and just picked up a, a transfer from USC, too. So uh, keep on trucking their dogs. But uh, good luck to you, you and your son out there for the uh, national championships in track. Where is that going to be? So we've got uh, state coming up in Ellenwood. Then we'll go regionals in Tampa. And then nationals later in July will be in Oregon. So he'll get his first opportunity to run on the track at Oregon. So he's pretty fired up about that. So, uh, yeah, so excited about that. See if you can get a landing and take you out to dinner or something. Yeah, like something. I mean, come on. But, That'll be good. So, hey, we really appreciate your time today. And uh, go dogs. Appreciate it, Coach. And I appreciate everybody that supports Georgia, whether it's the – highest level donor or the the person that, you know, buys the, the any seat in the stadium or comes for one game. We appreciate it. We couldn't do it um, without everyone. And it's what makes Georgia so special. It makes my job the best job.